He was 30 odd, 20 odd, 30, beat us three times. So I went back with a shotgun, fired it at his house. By the time I'd met Davy, I was a well accomplished car thief. I was a, a good burglar. We'd have money, pocket full of money, plenty of money, and we'd still be out committing crime just for the sake of committing crime to get better at it. Vision of Cartier, and that's when I started mixing with like Dennis Nielsen, uh, Moira Henley, and Rose West. It was a complete nightmare. I mean, Dennis Nielsen become me pal. Didn't even know who he was, because I'm only 21. What do I know with serial killers? And I was handcuffed to the screw, so I punched the screw, knocked him out, got six months for that, and pulled the handbrake on through this gap. Paddy feels aggrieved that I have written the book. He feels aggrieved that I have aligned myself with a Sears family. And ultimately, he set up a YouTube channel to bully me. But unfortunately for him, he's come across somebody who doesn't take bullying. Conroy put it all on to Davey. And look at what it, look what happened to Davey. It caused a mental breakdown. It caused, it caused, it, it caused his life to be ruined, really. A little kid called Tony Steele. Tony Steele. Little Cockney kid. He's to press the bell for the screws to run for the riot and stab them in the back. Pulled out and a police car come when I used to jump out the car to 30 miles an hour. <laughs> 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 and run as fast as I could oh, shit. and just leave them in the car. So we've got an exclusive today organised by Steve Rafe. All the links will be in the description box for everybody. And Davey, who Steve has done a little bit with in the past, is ready to tell his full story. And I've been watching what Davey had done. He's got a little bit of that wild man energy about him, so it's going to be a buzz and a proper good one. You may remember Cookie when we did a Zoom on Steve's channel and we had a laugh um, that evening as well. So Cookie's going to be telling some of his story in the context of Davey's. And there's actually going to be a book coming out that both these guys are going to be putting together. So we've got that look, look to look forward to as well. And huge thank you to Steve Rafe again for arranging this, you know, with everything going on in your life right now. Really appreciated, much love and respect. So we're going to go straight over to Davey then. All right. And uh, thanks for, you know, for doing this, Davey. Oh, yeah, right. yeah. Where were you born and what was it like growing up for you originally? West End, Newcastle, Noble Street. And how was your childhood? Crime. Crime. How so? Seven year old, nine year old. Wow. I was put to secure a care when I was nine for Robin. Wow. And then I went to Acre Special Unit for child murderers because I kept escaping. You went to Acre Unit for how many murders? No, not for murders. Child killers, please where they put child killers that kill one of the children. So we tried to escape from a child home. Gotcha, child where, killers. Where they put the child killers that have killed people and the only children. Yeah, The yeah. mixtures were them. Right, wow. So when did you two first come to know each other? Um. It was 1990 or 91. That's right, aye. Aye, well, what happened was, uh, I'd been mixed up in crime loads. By the time I'd met Davey, I was well on the path to being a, a criminal. Uh, and I'd started drinking in a pub in the West End of Newcastle. And by this time, Davey had been locked up for six years for assaulting a police officer. So he hadn't been on the street for quite a while and this psychopath 
and I mean Sega Puff, uh, started a fight in the pub with me, me, me dad over me, over them ch- chatting up me, me mum. Yeah. You know, well, this kid, I mean, nobody in the West End of Newcastle at the time would 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 fight this 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 laddie, you know. And I was like sat in the bar with all the lads, you know, watching this bloke set about me da. So I jumps up, run away, puts this bloke straight in the head, knocks him clean. Everybody jumps up, gets rid of me out the bar, helps me parents get out the bar. And then this bloke started... Uh, Chasing us about the street with machetes and stuff and that, you know? And that's when I first started carrying uh, weapons on the street, bottles of ammonia, big bayonets, stuff like that. Then Davey got out of jail, heard about me, because I'd been burgling, I'd been throwing cars for fun, and, and he says, I'll sort it out for you. Went and seen this psychopath, because Davey I was, was the only one mad enough, really, to fight him three <laughs> times. <laughs> and sorted it out for us, and I never got any hassle at all of him since, and that's how me and Davey met. Paddy Conway, John, didn't they? What was the situation, Davey, that led to the police having a charge on you for assaulting a cop? Uh, I was wanted for the shooting on Colin the Wedding. Sorry? A shooting. A shooting? He was want- wanted for a shooting. I fired a shot at his house. After he beat us in a fight, I was 16. He was 30 odd, 20 odd, 30. Beat us three times. So I went back with a shotgun, fired it at his house. Uh, and they wanted us for that. Why, at the Rock Public House in Critters Park, me and my brother and the little mini pulled out in a Police car come when I used to jump out the cars at 30 miles an hour. <laughs> 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 and run as fast as I could. Oh, shit. And just leave them in the car. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so I jumps out, ran round the block of the flats, and I'm in the flats and I'm holding the door with this busy push in the door. So I said, I can't, I'm gonna have to do this cunt. So I pulled the door and he fell in. I just got his radio and gimmick, gouged his eye. Uh, he got six years. Seven years first and he uh, knocked off on variation. So how old were you when he went into the prison? Fifteen. Fifteen? Well, for fourteen, thirteen, detention centre. How did you find that? Loved it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sorry. After all I knew. Care who yeah, yeah. I loved it. So did you know a lot of people in there already? No, I knew some, the Newcastle lads, and the ones that knew me dad. So I got on quite well. Yeah. Davy, well, Davy's dad was a very, very, very well-respected villain in Newcastle. Do you want to give us the backstory on, on Davy's dad? He was just a well like a rook. Everyone had respect for him. Well, uh, aye, Big Davy, that's right. Big Davy. Big Davy, that's what. He was that's thirty right. odd stone. Mm-hmm. Jesus. Well, he could run. <laughs> 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 he used to race him in a hundred yards. <laughs> <laughs> aye, Big Davy. Yeah. Well, Paddy was a bit. It was like big. Your dad's sidekick at one time, wasn't he? Uh, so he used to, Paddy used to run a boot for your dad. Was that how Paddy came into Davy's life? No, Paddy was with me and sister. With your mum's sister? Since I was about seven or nine years old, he's been with me mum's sister. So was he like an uncle to you? He was, I. Yeah. And you liked him? I didn't like him. No. In the beginning, you didn't like him? I didn't like him at all at any time. Bullies. He was a bully? Uh, a bully. And who was he bullying? Anyone he could get away with. He'd take them. I think he was a big man. Fighting people with their names. Uh, if you had a bit of money, he'd look for any excuse to... Extort you. Mm-hmm. And how was he getting away with that then? Was he a lone wolf or was he part of a crew? A big family. 
Our big family. So the family were known where you grew up? Paddy wasn't a fighter, the family, the other brother was a fighter. His big, brother? Big Michael, I. Big Michael mm-hmm. was, was Paddy's brother. Mm. Younger brother. Younger brother. And he, he had the biggest reputation, did he? Uh, for mm. fighting. For aye, fighting. Yes. For fighting, aye. And were these like, were they like an armed robber crew as well? No, no. We walked the villainy, drugs and that, and, but uh, we never done armed robbies. So it was like bar fights and... Uh, yeah, well... Busy fights, you know? Local mm-hmm. beefs. Fighting the cops. Right. How many siblings did, did Paddy have? Three, four brothers, five brothers, and three sisters. Mm-hmm. Four sisters. And did they all end up getting into crime and going to prison? No. 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 But well, they were a big family, that fierce reputation. Uh, it was mostly through that arm, wasn't it? Big well, Lenny. Oh, Lenny. Oh, Lenny was aye, a cause he, aye, he had a, 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 a fighting reputation on Scotchwood Road, and that's why, because it was like loads of pubs on Scotchwood Road. And on Scotchwood Road at that time, through the 60s and the 70s, you know, whoever was like the hardest, could fight the hardest on Scotchwood Road was considered the hardest man in the tune, you know? And that's where all the fighting used to happen on Scotchwood Road, you know? So, and that's that's where the Conroy name first come up, like, in the 60s, with Lenny and Billy, his brother. You know, and they, they were good blokes. And, and were there other families who were rivals of the Conroys? Not then. Not then, this is the 60s and 70s uh, when they get established. It was the 80s and 90s that that happened. Mm-hmm. So they ruled the neighbourhood? No, well, it was the Glovers. Big Davy. My dad run Ben Bun Road. Run Bun Road, Ben, ben Will. Elzik. Al Ben Will. Uh, well, the drugs and that. Mm-hmm. Mm. So talk us through the first day you met Paddy. I was a child. Yeah. Uh, I just done a burglary. And I sold him the stuff. <laughs> and after that, he bought the stuff off us every time until his brother took a sheep's in coat off me, mate. And his other brother, God bless him, he's dead now. Kidnapped me other mate and told them not to graph with us because they wanted us to graph with them. So I was making good money. How did he get kidnapped? Who? Oh. Did you say he got kidnapped? Not him. No. His friend. Your pal. Me pal. Your pal. They took the, the HTV off the car when we parked in the back lane to sell some stuff to Jimmy. And when we went in, we come out and we tried to start it and they come running through the back lane. <laughs> 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 so we just rolled down the back lane Straight on the main road, across the grass, and it wouldn't get any further, the courtway. So they kidnapped him, tortured him a bit. Tortured him? How so? They just threatened him with a crossbow in there. Oh. Strong. So he was, uh, he was a bit fearful and knocking the room with us after that. But I've dealt with the Conroy since I was a kid all my life. And Paddy's just a villain. He always has been, always will be. So during your time in prison then, you said it was easy for you, you liked it. No, the last bit wasn't. The last sentence, when I had the children to care for, Mm. that killed us. How old were you then? 26. So that's almost a decade after this first one. Um, but this first one then, what kind of stuff did you experience or see inside the prison? Everything. I fell off the roof of Franklin, stopped breathing. That had to bring us back to life. What happened to Franklin? How did that start? Yeah, how did you get on the roof? I was, 
Dominic Noonan set, got us on the walkway roof and sent me up the helicopter way, pulled the helicopter way down and set up a whole jaw way because I was 17 stone, a whole all of it, so I went up first and then I fell off two years later, <laughs> shouting at the screws. I stopped breathing. That was all in the papers. Because I shouldn't have been there because I was a YP in Franklin. I when think I was 18 when the start was up and sent us to Franklin. Because Castleton couldn't be now with us. What were the guards like back then? Were they like mili ex-military style people? Ex-army, ex-pitmen. Some horns, some ones I could have a faith. Some there were some decent ones, but I never tend to get on with them until later years when the putters were me down when he got the uh, seven six seven year first thirty kilo. The putters were them in Durham, and that's when I learned learn how to manipulate screws and busies and that. How would you manipulate them? To give them a taster. What's that? Keep the wing under control. Mm. Hand the old knife in. Hand the old phone in. Get all your videos. And that's what my dad learned is to manipulate them. Because before that, I'd rather just punch them. I wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate to punch a screw. And they knew it. So what was the battles like in Durham when the screws? Not much so Durham, because they say I had over familiarity with the screws. That's why they wouldn't send us back there. They sent me to Franklin, they sent Paddy back to Durham. But they sent me to Franklin in the seg when I was up the trail and I had my fair share of battles with them there. So they sent a lot of men in on you? Tied us up. Tied you up? Stripped us. Assaulted us. The worst one was Belmarsh from Birmingham. What happened there? I just lost my head. Did something trigger that? Drugs. Was a drug induced psychosis. What drug was it? Uh, cocaine. Cocaine, okay. Uh, all of a sudden, having any amount of it every day and then getting cut off. We're being a double high risk cat here. I couldn't handle it. I lost my head, tried to kill myself. Rip loads of people. But I tried to help this. And just couldn't understand the situation I was in. I couldn't understand the surroundings. I thought everyone was setting us up. I thought the screws were. I used to wet the mattress on night time. Because I thought the screws were on the side of fire and killed it in the cell. Wow. And they used to do things to provoke us in and out the strip cell, pause in the strip cell, and now I come out back out and start again. Mm -hmm. But the old I got. It's, I just lost interest for violence when they put us on that injection. What's it called, that thing that they give you? Depo. The pixel. How does that feel? I've had any violent urges since I've been on it. <laughs> this is good. Well, I used to think of violence all the time. Mm. At one stage, 
and I thought violence was the answer to everything. You, if you couldn't get something done, you, you used violence or you used your, your body language to get it. Now I talk about things and I, I listen and I act different. There's no violence left in it. Has that changed your life? With the kids it has. Good. How many kids you got? Four. Four? Busy. And none, not one of them's a criminal. Wow. Not smoke, no drugs. Do you think seeing their life has influenced One them? of them's a barrister. A barrister? Aye, the winger. Bloody hell, they're doing well. So tell us more about the att attempted escapes. There was one in the 80s where I come from, Ruin Newton, who used to take you on the trip bus. 30 years the Crown Court, dropped me off a different court. I got handcuffed to Peter Fur away and I was in the cell with him so I had the shampoo in a Mars bar packet to slip the cuff. He said, it's not going to come off. I said, it is coming off. <laughs> <laughs> he was supposed to stand with a brain, hold the screws where I popped the window with a handcuff still dangling. He jumps out the window when I pops it and runs. Oh, shit. Then jump on me, pull me pants off, pull me top off. I run down a high street with no clothes on. And that woman that was in the journal the next day, the paper said, you come past me, there's a stitch on, jumped over that wall. <laughs> <laughs> was that the only time you tried to escape? No, there was another one in Durham when they were taking us to court, they slipped the cuff again, I just took off. But it was my luck, it was a marathon runner, Robson, the screw. <laughs> and every time I turned round and chased him, he was running away. <laughs> and then turning back when I was turned the other way, running. <laughs> I just gave up. <laughs> <laughs> there was an infamous one on the Felon Bypass as well with, with Paddy Conroy. Um, what happened there? Uh, Paddy asked us to organise an escape, so I said, aye. Got people to sort it. And I didn't think we were gonna, it was going to come off. But we'll come past you with roundabout. And the bus was still travelling 50 miles an hour. But there was a hole in the mesh between the driver and the back. And I was handcuffed to the screw. So I punched the screw, knocked them who got six months for that. And pulled the handbrake on through this gap. And the bus has done a turn and went between the Range Rover that was waiting for us and the BMW that was waiting for oh us. Oh my God. As though it was meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> and I've just went, they've got guns, you better let it do. Gives the property and the private cash as well. I took all the fines and everything they had on me. Mm-hmm. They changed prison policy because of that. And then we went to uh, Blackpool, didn't we? We did, I went a good time in Blackpool. <laughs> <laughs> what did you get up to? Oh, <laughs> alleged things. What uh, happens in Blackpool stays in Blackpool. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, we did rob it mad, didn't we? We did rob the place, silly, we did. Jewelry shops, I mean. Mm -hmm. Allegedly. We loved uh, the comets. The comet stores, and big comet stores. Uh, you could break into them dead easy, you know, through the false ceilings, didn't it, David? Mm. Yeah. So what, what's the consequences in the UK system, then, if you do an attempted escape or an escape? Do they add more it time on? It depends if it's armed. Mm. If it's armed, you get a good whack. A good beating. But if it's just an escape, you get six months. The governor normally deals with it. What the hell? It's nothing, mm. is it? You get about. Oh, um, well, you get a year in straight. Uh, I'm 28 years in, in CC. Which so means what? Salty confinement. Aye. Uh, mm. Salty confinement. Uh, you just got a concrete bed, haven't you? Just 
about six inches off the floor and they give you like a, a zoot suit thing that you can't rip. Uh-huh, it, green and yellow. Aye, uh, and a, a toilet roll and a paper potty. Do you get fed well? No, no, not. The put things in your food as well. Why? Mm. They say it's just salt, but I've seen them do some awful <laughs> things to my food. Glass. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have, uh, it was glass, but I've tasted some funny things on my food. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I still had it though. Oh. <laughs> we were gonna you never do come dine with me with Davy Glover. Oh. <laughs> I still have it. Mm-hmm. So while Davy then, Cookie, was going in and out of the system in his late teens and in his 20s, what was your life like? And were you going in and out of the system? No, I was, because like, I'm like six, seven years younger than Davy. You know, I, I, when he was the, in and out of the jail, doing his six and stuff and that, I, I started off just with petty crime, really, and... I was stealing car radios, just the anything I could rob for sweets and money and all that, you know. But by the time I'd met Davy, I was a well accomplished car thief. I was a, a good burglar and not house burglary, even though I did do some house burglaries, but it was mainly shop burglaries that I'd done, you know. Uh, and if we did day houses, we like to travel out what area to burglary. We like would I always like to try and burgle houses where we could... I don't know. I'm not going to say what we could find in some of the houses. Uh-huh. Uh, but that's... Yeah. It's expensive belongings. No, we Things would look about, for... It's about accessories <laughs> that go like that. Aye. Oh! <laughs> Aye. Uh, because that's how we got them back then, you see. Uh, a lot of them. But, yeah, I was well accomplished by the time Davy. Me and Davy met up, you know, and it just got better. Just got better. I felt like a pure outlaw. <laughs> what were you spending your money on? Nighthood. We weren't on drugs. We weren't taking drugs. We what, smoked small cannabis. cannabis. That was it. We never drank. We did drink occasionally. But we had both cars. And mm-hmm. Both cars and just had fun on the streets. Sometimes we'd pay the kids to break the busies and stuff like that in the middle of the night and just have fun on the streets. I mean, we can, we'd have money, pocket full of money, plenty of money, and we'd still be out committing crime just for the sake of committing crime to get better at it. That was one motive for committing crime. To get any crime? crime. Mm-hmm. We'd done anything. So you almost chose a career in crime? Oh, uh, I did, I, I, I did choose it. Well, I left school, I couldn't read on out. You know, by then I had earned a little bit of money stealing the teacher's handbags at schools <laughs> and, you know, burgling and stealing cars and, I. As you guys were rising up in the crime world then, was there other big figures that you started to associate with or other big figures that you heard about that you looked up to? Well, I dealt with them, Stephen never. I dealt, like, I had drinks with the Sears, I was taught to them, I used to talk to Paddy, I used to talk, just cause I knew most of the villains threw me dead. Well, I looked up to Big Davy. Most I... of the villains knew me dead, and so I, I automatically got on with him. You're well protected. Oh, he was well looked after. Oh, he could protect himself, believe he didn't need he couldn't you, Davy? I the was war, crazy. The what the none of them wanted out to deal with Davy, like. I was crazy. Mm-hmm. So what was your first encounter with Paddy? Uh, my first encounter, uh, I got dragged into his sitting room. Cause his house got raided. Cause I used to, my pal used to clean the dog. Used to look after his dogs, his Rottweilers, you know. Cause he just let his Rottweilers loose on the street and terrorise all the neighbours. Paddy did. Well, my pal used to take, walk them dogs and keep the keep the yard clean. <laughs> 
So, but, so I used to sit on the wall and watch him date, and I was just terrified of these dogs. And uh, he soon got raided, and Paddy had stashed an ounce of weed, an ounce of tack, in his skip outside. So but, uh, when he got to the, the busy station and all that, uh, he went looking for his, his tack, couldn't find it. So me and the dog walker got pulled into Paddy's living room and Paddy's big, huge, scary man, and I'm looking up at him and he's saying, where's my dope? Does your dad smoke dope, does he? And I didn't even know what dope is. You know, I haven't got a clue. Uh, but that was the first time I met Paddy Conroy. And the last time I met him, before I got locked up for me index offence, he turned around and says to this. Because it was at the, when they were, with the, the, the heart of war, he wanted us to, uh, I want to see this. He wanted us to watch his back in the car, in the, in the, in the pub, and just sit in the corner of the pub with a gun. And I looked at Davy, and Davy knew that I wasn't up for it. And Davy says, no, I'll just leave him. And then Paddy turned on and said, you do everything he tells you to do. Doesn't matter. What it is, you've got to do it, because you're going to do it anyways, so do it. And that was the last words he said at us. You know, the Harra War is interesting because it's a family called the Harrisons in Newcastle. And Davey um, has listened to a lot of Paddy's podcasts where he maintains that this war between the Conroy family and the Harrisons was started because of a fire. Uh, which he claims that the Harrisons caused, but Davy has the truth behind that. It wasn't caused by a fire, Davy, was no, it? No, two fifty, you know, having a fight, straight fight. One of the Harrisons and one of the Conroy, Ricky Conroy. It's like the traditional family feud then. And then the Har Paddy stepped in, so the Harris stepped in, and that's when it started. And what damage was done from that feud over the years? Shootings, petrol bombs. Anyone get killed? No. No. People did get seriously injured. Some, some died, but it wasn't over that feud. It, it was the, uh, the offsprings of that feud. Other people getting involved in got themselves hurt. Aye. Mm -hmm. And what were you making of the feud, Cocky? Well, I was just a young'un at the time, so I was kind of terrified about the whole situation. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got to say, Suicide Square was like a naughty place to go on, and we were all the families. They're the only family who ever give us a like, bad nightmares when I was a young'un, you know, because I used to suffer from bad nightmares. And I, one time I, would, I jumped through a plain glass window in the middle of the night thinking I was getting attacked by the horrors. So uh, that's how bad they were, but they're good people, you know, they're good people. Were there any attempts to kidnap or attack you? Mm-hmm, yeah, there were. What, could you describe them? Well, I, I got kidnapped off Paddy for the ball. Mm -hmm. And what, 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 what was the reason for that? Because I screwed his ball. What? We took his ball. We took his ball, aye. We scrapped his ball. And uh, he waited. He, he was dead sly, but the way he kidnapped us, me and my pal. And because uh, he waited, and Davy went to prison and then got with. And he took, uh, he took me to, and I always remember, I was scared, but, but because this other bloke was in the car with us with Paddy, I knew he wasn't going to, re I knew this bloke wouldn't let Paddy seriously hurt us. So how, how did he get you in the car? Just grabbed, was nice to us, was really nice to us, as if it was me pal and all that. <laughs> got us in the car and then turned on us and slapped us straight in the face. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, you seen your little cunt. You burgled my bar. And you know, you look at the McIntyre video, how fat Paddy's eating, how scary he looks. He looked even scarier back then. You know, so 
And then I got tucked to his house in North Bourne Street, top of North Bourne Street, with me pal, and he had me sat in the chair, slapping his, shooting and barling at us. And it wasn't until, like, the, were beating up me pal and that, and got the chainsaw out, and I was like, that's when I admitted to the bar, and I, cause I, I couldn't, I couldn't face me pal getting battered. So you got a chainsaw out, you said? I got a chainsaw, I got a chainsaw. Not Paddy, mind you. The two people who uh, who had a had of me pal. Cause me, there was <coughs> there was Paddy and his pal who got a had of me in, in the Jeep, right? And then there was uh, two of Paddy's pals who got a had of my pal and took with the Paddy's. And them's the two who was battering my pal. And because he wouldn't see him out, they got the chainsaw and they were going to... Uh, I don't think they would have caught him with it, like, you know, but I was just a young'un at the time, so I wasn't sure what was going on. I was in the house, I had a bloody nose, I was getting slapped a bit off Paddy, and my pal was going to get seriously hurt. And I thought, I'll just tell him I burgled it, what's he going to do? And he says, you've got three days to go and get me, what was it? I think it was eight grand he asked us for. And I thought, where am I going to get that? I'm not going to do robbery or something, yeah. But Davey got out a week later and never heard another thing about it. They got away, they got away with three and a half thousand, didn't you, I think? And, and, and Davey said to me, he says, that's the only time you ever got paid off, Conroy. That's right. Aye. Aye. The only time you ever got paid off, earned any money with a party, was when you robbed them. <laughs> <laughs> so, what? so you, so you were under threat and Davey stepped in and stopped the threat, is that what you're saying? Uh, soon as Davey got out of jail, didn't have to pay any money, he stopped everything, and he says, don't worry about it, Stephen, I'll, I'll sort this out. That was automatic as soon as Davey got out of jail, or did Davey have a word with him? No, I just... Just stopped straight away. Just, he pulled me with Fred the head and said, are you going to pay the money back? I went, aye. Aye, I'm going to pay back. So he must have been quite scared of him. <laughs> yeah, he was, yes, he was, yes, he was terrified at DAV. When you were robbing that place, were you aware it could end in a situation like that? No, because I didn't think we would get caught. You know, I didn't, I, I was thinking, ah, it's Paddy's ball and I could end up getting the uh, battered and all up by doing this. But I didn't think I get, would get caught. But I know who grasped what up now. I didn't know who grasped what up. Aye. Was it a friend or associate? No, it was someone where I'd put the damp on someone's house and that person told a relative who knew Paddy who then told Paddy. Another villain. Uh, he battered him, Davy. That's why he grasped on me. He battered him at the back of the green tree. He come in, come in the green tree. Shoot, no, D, where's Davy Glover? He thinks he's a hard man. He was lifting the heaviest weight in Scotchy at the time. And then everybody was scared of him because he could have a shot. And Davy says, I'm here. I'll come round with you. And Davy went round with him. Within his eye. Uh, two minutes, he was screaming. Go, what you done to this? And Davy had battle at the living daylight with him. His eye came out. Mm-hmm. Nearly. Bloody hell. Mm-hmm. So when Davy got out of prison this time then, what was life like for the two of you? Were you buzzing because your best mate was out and... Well, I was locked up. What I was sentence. locked up, most of it. For okay. Life sentence. What led to that? Someone called me a grass or cookie. Went off my head. Went off my head. Killed him. Should never have happened. There's a... Uh, I mean, at that point, I had committed a lot of crime. I mean, I had committed a lot of crime. I was well and truly accustomed to committing crime. But to commit that kind of crime, I was not prepared for the, the psychological stuff that come along with it. It was horrible, horrible. I felt like a monster. I felt ill. Oh, yeah, was talking about it. And then they put us in a... We meant to look after us, and it didn't. They put us in, they locked us up with serial killers and all sorts of shit. So what year was this, and how old were you? 1994, and I was just turned 21. 21, 1994. 
And you, so you're going to the highest category prison because no, of the nature no. of the crime. The 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 provisionally cut aid is right, and they put us in Durham Jail Hospital. Then the after about three four months, they took us off provisional cut aid, and that's when I started mixing. When like Dennis Nielsen, uh, Myra Henley, and Rose West, four dampers doing from us. Uh, it was uh, it was a fucking, it was a complete nightmare. I mean, Dennis Nielsen become me pal. I uh, didn't even know who he was because I'm only 21. What do I know about serial killers? He's a very what do I know about Oh, he was already Desi. He was canny. Do you think he was attracted to you? <laughs> <laughs> he might have been attracted. I ticked all his boxes, but he was ticking my boxes <laughs> because he come across like you know the score with the screws, how to manipulate the screws, how to manipulate the system. And I was like, I was obsessed with trying to escape and stuff like that. And well, I didn't know who he was, you know. And he, he, I didn't think he would have tried out on with us. He made a fancy this. Not you, bothered, like. Was this the period of time when you were still on remand mm -hmm. in the beginning? Um, what, what are they telling you facing for that? See that again, What Sean? sentence were they saying your lawyer was saying you were facing? Life sentence. Life. Life sentence. So you knew from the get-go before any trials or anything? Oh, aye. aye. Yeah. I knew I was going to jail. It was near if so much about that, like. And what does life mean? What did it mean in the system at that point? Well, I gave you 99 years in prison. It's just IPP, is it like that? It's like that, and then you're giving it a, a tariff afterwards. Mine was set at 12 years by the judge, then up to 14 by the, uh, home, the home secretary, and I done 18, 17 and a half, and got out, went back in on a recall for growing cannabis for two and a half years. Right. What was your trial like? It was a nightmare. It was now facing me victim's family and stuff. Oh, it's, God. Sean, honestly, was the worst thing. It was the most hardest thing I ever done in my life. Were you when you committed this crime? Then were you on any substances or alcohol no, or anything? No, I'd had a couple of pints of lager, and that was it. Uh, no, I was. You got to understand, I was totally not decriminalised back then. I was extremely violent because of what had been going on on the streets, and cause cause Davy and that had been locked up. I was on my own, so my social structure had totally changed, and that just made me lash out violently. So anybody who started anything with us back then, I would have looked to stab them straight away, squirt them with ammonia, and if I needed a gun, get a gun and shoot them. I'm disgusted to see all that, because I'm totally ashamed of that behaviour, especially because of what I let me. And that's... That's, uh, you know, but... Are we able to talk about the night of the crime? No, I no, wouldn't want to talk about that, because it's a very sensitive situation, and, you know, I didn't really enjoy doing it. I did it because I want to bring awareness to this, you know, so that's why I talk about it, willing to talk about it. So go on then, so you're in this trial, and how long is the trial? About a week. About just a week. a week? Just a week. Do you, like. do you think you've got a prayer of beating it or do you think you're going down? No, I know I'm going to do I wanted to plead guilty. I want, that's what I wanted to do. But my barrister at the time turned around and says, Stephen, it's the Crown like you yeah, like to have a trial around these kinds of cases because they want all the facts to come out in open court so that the victim's family understand what went down. Show justice so has been done, good closure, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what about the jury members? What 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 were they like? <laughs> they seemed all right. They were... <sighs> I was just totally criminalised, you know. Yeah. As soon as I opened my mouth, it was just criminal, criminal, criminal. You know, and I admitted that it didn't dock on that, you know. So it's a horrible situation to be in where you say something. The normal person would, wouldn't even take it in, but a criminal looks at everything to earn. Mm -hmm. 
And if summer comes along and you can earn, you take the opportunity. And he was just a criminal till he got caught up with me and we got involved in guns and that. Allegedly. This podcast is sponsored by Harry's. Harry's is way more than a super sharp razor company. They're here to revamp your whole routine from close shaves and flake free hair all the way to clear healthy skin. Harry's helps guys feel great. For this sponsorship, Harry's is offering a free travel-sized shower gel with a trial set to you, the viewers, to give you a chance to try their other products as well as shave. Please make sure to support this podcast and give your own shower shave a go by redeeming a free Harry's trial set. All you cover is £3.95 for delivery. Just head to harrys.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N, to have your set delivered and start a shave plan. Your freebie will be added at checkout. That's harrys.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Thank you for supporting Harry's. Link is in the description box below this video. And then that's what led him to suffer that member thing. How did it feel going back to your cell then after you were sentenced? A relief. Because you knew happy. you knew what the the conclusion of it, what the proceedings was. I was I was glad to get laid off. I I was me barrister turned on and said, "You look happy. You look like there's a big huge weight just being brought off your shoulders, lifted off your shoulders." And I was I was buzzing. I was happy to go back to Durham prison and. The serial killers. <laughs> <laughs> get back with Des. <laughs> Des, he was waiting. Oh, I get back with this, the... the, the. <laughs> Aye. Were you in a cell on your own? No, oh. with Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, yeah, I did, I. I did get... I did get padded up with Desi for one night. Oh. You did? For one night. You really was shared a cell with Dennis Nielsen. Holy we shit. Aye, aye. Aye. Okay, cards or? Did you know at that point what he'd done? No. I knew we had killed, been, uh, was a murderer and that, yeah. but I, I, I'd committed the same offence and yeah. stuff. You know, but I didn't have a clue that he had People killed. under the floorboards. Aye, <laughs> killed all these people and all that. <laughs> and the way he like narrates it in that like Mr. Man, cartoon voice. Mm -hmm. Woke up in the morning, I picked up the floorboards and there was mm -hmm. too many corpses there to put anyone else under that day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So what was that like then, the night with him? Uh. <laughs> Did, was your sleep uninterrupted? No, he didn't bother us. <laughs> I'd done everything I asked him to do, to tell you the truth. No, it's a big story, man, how we ended up paired up with Dennis Nielsen. Oh, please tell it us. Yeah. Well, I'd been obsessed with escape and hadn't I? Right? So, Des is on the ward and he's got like, it's like everybody knows him on the ward and what have He's got friends there and stuff. And he says to us, I know where you can escape. And I says, How's that? He says, Get yourself sectioned to a mental hospital. Right? And you'll be able to escape from there, it'd be much easier for you to escape. So I goes, all right, well, how do I do this? He says, well, cut yourself. So, well, I'm not really into cutting myself and stuff and what have you now. So for weeks I'm trying to f build up the courage to cut myself and I couldn't do it, I couldn't do it. So I says to Desi, that's not working for me, I can't cut myself, yeah? He says, well... You know, a few of the lads there, they want, they, they're wanting sectioned. He says, and they want me to cut them, cut them. You know, well, one of the reasons why I didn't cut myself in that was because I wasn't sure that they would definitely section me and I'd be able to escape. And Desi says, well, I'll prove it to you. So, cut one lad, he got sectioned. Cut another lad, he got sectioned. I think he cut three all in all. And then I... Within a 
six, seven weeks, I turn and says to Marty, then Des, you're going to have to cut me so I can get out. And he, uh, he says, well, I'm going to have to get padded up with you because you can't deal on this ward. They'll know that it's, that it's a con. So he got the nurse to pad us up with together. That. Two nights I was with Desi. The first night, he cut us on my arm there. Uh, I went and this, this, this nurse doctor stitched us up in the anaesthetic on out my numb and thought it was like to teach us a lesson. And then the second night, because Desi says, ah, oh, it's because there's been too many slashings. That's why they won't, <laughs> they won't uh, section you. Well, to me, it was all just a bit of graft to get out of jail, me, you know. <laughs> so I says, all right, then, Desi, you're going to have to cut me throat. So I says, go on, get the razor. I'll hear doing on the bed. I says, go on. Boom, cut me throat. Rung the bell. I was sectioned that night. Oh, well. Section, then I escaped. Three months later, I escaped. Was with a couple of days. How, how did you actually escape from, from the building? Whatever building they put you in? It's the St. Luke's Hospital in Middlesbrough. And there was just crappy reinforced windows and that. And I just booted it open and climbed up onto the roof because it was all wire fences, like the prison run it. But I could get up onto the roof. Ran across the roofs, I thought I was Mac Vic and everything I did. <laughs> I really did, it was crusty. And uh, I, I took off. Uh, heard the helicopter come, I hid in it, found a shed that I could lock from the inside, hidden there for 24 hours. Come out, chore the car with a three inch nail, got all the way at the gate, said, conked through the. It, it, Petwell and Gateshead and got a lift off someone from Gateshead who knew I had escaped been watching us on the telly and says, hey, I'll help you, cookie. Get in the car. I'll drop you off. <laughs> they were supporting you. I dropped us off over the West End. And, wow. Uh, I was back in the West End. The police were getting to people's doors because they thought I had escaped because I was, they thought I was going to Well, I somebody. got arrested after an escape with Conway. I got Nick with Cookie. Mm-hmm. My mirrors were... Oh, Tron Vans. Tron Vans. And they come on top and I bodged me way out and he got nicked. Mm-hmm. I got away and then they surrounded the area as soon as they knew who he was and who he was linked to. And they caught me a half an hour later. I give a false name. <laughs> 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 so how long have you been out before you got caught? Oh, I'd only been out a few days. Oh. I got, I, I didn't know how, but the police knew I was in this flat. And I was waiting, I was on my way up to Scotland. I'm glad, I'm glad that I got caught, to tell you the truth. Because I would have just been encouraged to maybe commit other serious acts of violence and stuff and that. And uh, I don't think I would have been up for it because the amount of remorse that I felt after I committed my index offence was unreal and mm-hmm, I stopped us from committing vi- further violence, that's for sure. So they caught you and dragged you back? Mm-hmm. What was your reception like? For, screws didn't like us, give us 28 days CC and hide us in, in patches for 12 months and just give us no, really. It's a Durham regime. Regime, getting out and plenty of it. So, what was your routine like? There were just, I'd be in a single dump all the time. Uh, I'd have to take my clothes off every night and give them to the, to the prison officer. I kind of call them screws because they're all human beings. And uh, so, I, and that's what I'd have to do every night. But the wood letters mix because I was in the hospital with the serial killers and. Uh, the wood letters mix on association time. So that was it. I was on bang up the rest of the time. So it, was it diff- of a high profile killers you were with this time? Uh, well, seeing that, when I got back, Desi had gone because his, his, his high court judgment had just come in as well. He was going to do natural light or not. So, that's, so he was gone. But there was. Because Moira, 
Moira was still there. Rose had left because Moira and Rose didn't get on. Moira hated Rose. And because I used to, I got a tab, a couple of tabs off Moira. Because, you know, when me had been in such a state, I'd gone under the list, listeners, damper, and sit on a Sunday and talk to the listener. Well, Moira would use the phone at the top of the landing every Sunday afternoon. And I'm, she's just heard me talking, I need a tab, he's done in. And, and, she's, and she's walking by and she's like, I'll give you a tab, Kurt, she has a tab for him. Aye, and, uh, was Fred still there? No, Fred wasn't there. Fred, Fred no. This, he, there. Was, he was, he was, he hung himself Kelly before this. When before he fell, him, yeah. After he killed himself in Birmingham. After Charlie pulled his leg off him <coughs> in the recess, Charlie Bronson pulled his wooden leg off him <laughs> in the recess at Birmingham. Mm. And then he hanged his cell. And then they put me in Fred West's cell that he hanged his cell in. Mm. Well, that's what they done with me on my murder trial. Because uh, on my murder trial, they put me in, in, in Moira Henley's old damper. So what's the women, men's going in the women's? How's that work? Well, on the hospital landing, there's like... So the It's like an L, no, no, it's like an L like that. So you've got dampers coming doing that way, which are the single dampers. And then you've got double dampers doing that aisle, doing that spur. You know, and halfway doing the spur, they had partitioned the door off, so they would lock that off on, during the day with my right and Rose on the other side, and on any time they'd open it, open it up so it was just one landing. And like, and them hospital dampers, you got like the, the, uh, the windows uh, on the door, like, or, or, or big windows, you know, they're kind of square like that, with just bars on so you can put your mirror out. And look, doing the landing, and I used to watch the telly and stuff. There was a telly on the, on the landing, and it was creepy. It was a creepy, horrible atmosphere. On that when it opened that door in the night time, it it really, really was. I got terrible nightmares because of it. I used to jump up the mill and he, thinking I'm seeing dead bodies, kick the door, screaming, "Let us out! Let us out! Let us out!" I just went free through it. Huh? Mm-hmm. Because of the nature of their crimes, the females, how were they treated? Well, my, they used to send food up on Myra. She'd never eat food. She, she only ever ate canteen food, Myra Henley. And because uh, uh, the prison officer, the SO, used to always oh, try and give me these food, uh, Myra's food. And I'd go, I'm not eating that. And it was lovely cheese and all. And I was thinking, oh, it's a better diet than I have, kids. <laughs> so I was tempted to eat her food, but I knew that the likelihood the lads would have done something to it. You know, but I but that was like the when I landed in Durham Hospital, it was the first time I'd ever heard of Moira Henley and Ian Brady. You know, uh, yeah. So I never really, I didn't have that emotional maturity to really understood understand what these people were about. I just got the horrible, creepy feeling that just was part of Durham Jail Hospital with them people in it. So, Davey, what was Charles Bronson like then? When did you first bump into him? I bumped into Charlie through Mickey Wraith, a lifer in Long Norton, in the library. He said, I want you to meet someone. Charlie wanted to meet us, so I shook his hand and just been a supporter of his ever since. He said he was lovely. Aye, uh, gentleman, Charlie. Mm. And then I was in Franklin and pulled something with him. He speaks very highly of Davey as well. I mean, obviously, I keep in touch with Charlie on a regular basis, week to week basis. And every time I speak to him, he'll often ask about different characters. And the two people he mentions the most are Fred the Head and Davey Glover. And he says uh, he had the utmost respect for both of them, you know. I've got the most respect for Charlie. It's a shame what's happened to him. Just a character. Mm-hmm. He's never killed anyone, he's never really hurt anyone badly. Mm-hmm. And he's, he's never been it. And it does beg the, beg the question whether Charlie has found his, he found his own rehabilitation in prison. And I, I really do believe he has. 
because he has been kept in isolation, because he has been kept from the mainstream prisoners and the high-profile criminals, not like Reggie Cray, who had to mix with them all and had no chance at all if prison, if, re if reform. And I think Charlie's had psychologists, he's had... The only people who are thinking around Charlie at the minute are professional people, or prison officers. And I think he's had positive relationships around him for a long time now. And I think he has rationalised things. He has got that focus where he has emotionally connected with with rehabilitation and not reoffending. I do not believe this man is dangerous, especially at 70 years of age now. 70 man. years of age. What a waste just, of taxpayers' money. Keep yeah. Absolutely. Well, yeah. He shouldn't be in there. There's worse cases that they let out child killers and that and people like that and then they keep a man like that in there for being a character. It's upside down. It is upside down. It's so you upset. It's all about money, Sean. Yes, it's a business. When he done that million pound damage on Broadmoor, Rufe wasn't getting away without. That's right. How did the beef between Charlie and Fred West start then? You said he was he took his leg. How did that begin? Charlie was walking through the land on the cat air wing at Birmingham and Fred was in the recess emptying his bucket and Charlie ran in and tried to take his leg off of and hit him with it. And hit him with it. <laughs> 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 Brilliant. <laughs> and, and what do you know? What how Fred reacted to that? I wasn't. I just got told after I went there. Yeah. He killed himself Afterwards, later that day. I killed himself. <laughs> yeah. Killed himself. Was it the same day? Aye. Yeah. Didn't he write on his wall something like "You'll never forget me, Fred" or something like that? <laughs> there was all sorts of mad things he wrote on them walls. I went in his cell after, because he was cut here. I went in his cell after him, the screws were in as well. Hmm. Was it eerie? Aye. Mm. I got to do it as quick as possible. <laughs> <laughs> what high profile killers did you come across in the prison system? All of them. All, All of the them. Ages. Mad fire high. How did you need it? the bus in the seventies in London? Palestinian forty odd year prison. He's just been released. Yeah. Uh, Peter, there was loads of them. The Ripper, Sutcliffe. I never come across the Ripper. Peter Tobin? Peter Tobin, aye. What was Peter Tobin's crime? He was a murderer, wasn't he? He murdered, uh, murdered women. Uh, Barnsley Beast. The Barnsley Beast. I've seen him go in the shower and five of them go in to beat him up and they've all come out with lumps and bumps on their head. Really? <laughs> the hell? He was built like a brick city. Was he? Uh, what did the Barnley Beast? I mean, I can imagine, but... He used to uh, get the woman from behind and rape them. Oh, shit. And Barnsley. Oh, my God. He was in Hull at first, now I met him in Long Larkin. Who do you think is the most dangerous person you ever came across? A little kid called Tony Steele. Tony Steele. Little Cockney kid. He used to press the bell for the screws to run for the riot and stab them in the back. Bloody hell. He's been about three day sentences now. Did you get along with him? Aye, I did. I was in the block a few times then. Wow. What about yourself, Cookie? I would say Dennis Neal's the most vi Dennis Nielsen's the most violent criminal I've ever met. Like, I mean, I did cross paths with Robert Maudsley 
a couple of times when I was uh, being tucked down the block, getting nicked in Durham, but I never got to like, meet him properly, but I could see the hurt. I recognised his pain. It was similar to mine. I've seen I've seen Bob Mosley myself through through a glass window when I was going to visit Charlie and he would they were passing he was passing and Charlie went, Oh there's Bob but and he gave us a wave. But Bob is the is the man who is is in what's called the silence of the lamb cell. Mm. You know, and he literally is under twenty four hour observation. What did he do? Um well it's what he's done inside, isn't it? He's three a mate or two we Bashed the head in the right and he had the brains. Oh, that guy. Yeah. The spoon in the, yeah. into the brains. But now that he's, was just a story, that though, showing that thing. <laughs> he's, he's now literally like like got very long hair. He doesn't cut his nails. He's got long nails. He's, he's hunched, hunched back now. Uh, but yeah, he's, he's quite a character. Again, Charlie speaks highly of him. He's, uh, but he see, because there's that kind of mentality, isn't it? Uh, you, you spend that time down the block. You're, You're with these people, people. And, and yeah, yeah, and he sees, he can see the positives in in in, in Bob, I guess. But so is he doing natural life then? Yeah, he oh. will never get out. No. Wow. What was your most scariest experience in there? I nearly got raped off coming up a visit. Holy shit! In Durham. I had about a good dozen of them. Runders and uh, I come out a visit, uh, punching us, trying to get get me pants doing and stuff and that, trying to make a squat, get get me drugs, and uh, somebody who I knew from the West End, not Davy, but somebody who I knew who was a character, a big character in Durham Jail at the time. See what was going on and come in and stopped them all from doing it and threatened them all. So I was very lucky because they were there. And I think it was about four years later, my other pal uh, chopped the kid's hand off, who was the the main person who was bullying us and going to rape us. Wow. Oh, God. That's interesting because you never, you don't hear about that as much in the UK system as in the US system. Like in the US system, you have to go to a rape class mm -hmm. to get taught how not to get raped. That's mm -hmm. how common it is. Mm -hmm. And you wonder, like, in, in the UK, does it happen? Mm -hmm. Some people say, I never heard of that. You know, no, it's an American it happens, thing. It happens for drugs. Over no, drugs. For drugs, they can't, they can't be a backside it's for drugs. It's rife now in the prison system. Do you have any stories of what, you know, happened? Well, that will stay between me and you because <laughs> who is it? Delinquent Nation said they they would rape them with spoons to get drugs out. Oh them. yeah, that's to get the drugs out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if if they've got a package and that's they can't, that's they what they're gonna do. It is. I mean, that's still classed as fucking rape in my opinion. Oh, yeah. still rape, yeah, oh, yeah, but I'm, it's I'm still is. Oh, I, I class it as rape, like. The worst situation I seen was that the Indian lad getting killed in Long Norton. Over what? He wanted to go on an exercise. This young Indian lad wanted to go on exercise, but the boss of the gang wanted him to stay in to cook. And he, he said, no, I'm going out. He said, I'll kill you. When the office got a, a cutting knife, met a knife off a screw, come back and stabbed him in the heart, dropped him straight away. How cheap is life in prison? On oh, that. Very cheap, very cheap. There's people beating the death in Durham. I oh, had a 20 pound cup, I oh, had a 20 pound canteen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How common were suicides? There's a lot of suicides, like, uh, especially in Durham prison and all that. You know, because uh, when I went back in on my recall, and I was only there, what, eight months or so, and I think there was like, four suicides and how I know that is because of the wood when the ambulance people would come in they'd have to load the ambulance up with the the suicide victim and the real outside my damper outside my window so what year was that yeah uh, when did I go back that's uh, 2012 
So on the long one, then, did you work your way down the security levels? Oh, me begging, aye, I did, aye. I had a, a like, I started off in Durham, Wormwood, and then I went to Wormwood Scrubs, was the first stage life I system. On the advice of uh, Dennis Nielsen. <laughs> he's <laughs> uh, he was like uh, your mentor, isn't he? He was. I remember this. I, I didn't have a clue who he was, man. He says, <laughs> uh, he says, aye, aye, could you get yourself doing the Wormwood Scrubs? He says, they'll get your telly and your heel, will start to calm down, and then get yourself to Grendon. Because he was, they mentioned Grendon to this. It was, Desio mentioned Grendon, and he says, oh, I know the governor there. And I says, oh, will you write him a letter for us? <laughs> and I, I ask him if he'll make sure they'll accept this. And I, I, he definitely yeah. liked you. Uh, yes. I, I. But this is like a headline, isn't it? It's yeah. like, Dennis Neal um, sure. slashed uh, my throat. And, but he was helping me out at the time. He was my mentor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, he helped us escape. I didn't think he wanted to kill us. I don't think he would. He, no. I don't think he... But to have a serial killer slash your throat, that's, that's a unique thing, isn't it? It is. And you must be wondering, with hindsight, what was going through his head to get you to move in with him, and then he's doing these things to you. It's, get, it's building up, isn't it, where he could, potentially. Do you think he was getting off on the fact of slashing people? And, I yeah. Well, I think the he was. power thing he was, I, I, yeah. it was, he got, because he had great people skills. He did have great people skills. And uh, he knew how to tick people's boxes for them, you know. I think I've told you the story before, but um, Charlie Bronson often tells me it. He says uh, the very first day that Dennis arrived on the landing, um, after he'd been sentenced for the, 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 the 16 murders in Muswell Hill and, and the other address in London, he, uh, he came in and two guys tried to take his canteen off him. And uh, he says, I wouldn't do that if I was you. And he goes, and the lads come, well, why is that? And he goes, well, he says, um, the, the, the sentence that I've been given, he says, is, a light, uh, is, is multiple life sentences, he says, is for killing young men. And he said, um, gay men. And the guys are looking, thinking, get to the point. And he says, so, he says, um, if you were to take my canteen office, then I have some contacts in the media, he says, who uh, would be very interested in my two new gay lovers <laughs> uh, inside this prison. Needless to say... These guys never took Dennis Nielsen's <laughs> canteen. Uh, but Charlie loved that. He said, he says, you know, very clever guy. Yeah. Very, very good at manipulating. And he said, um, yeah, you know, heinous crimes that he did, taking all those young boys' lives. Mm. But he said, you know, you could see that the guy was very, very intelligent, you know. Mm. Dangerous, psychopathic. So that's how he got his victims at the job centre, wasn't it? Some mm. of them, yeah, yeah, in the pubs. What, what was it like going down the security levels then? It was hard work because... You find it so hard to address your offending behaviour so you can reduce your risk, right? And then you didn't get the opportunity, did he? Or you see, you know, you're sat in front of these psychologists and you've got, like, no insight into your offending behaviour at all, you know? So, and they're uh, writing reports about you every three years saying he's still highly dangerous, still recommend that he stays in... Close con, uh, close conditions for the foreseeable future, and it was only until I got the grinding that I actually got the chance to work on reducing my risk and understanding properly what went on for us. Uh, then I went to Seacat, and Seacat was it was worse conditions than it was in Beacat, you know. So, because I never went to ear cat prison, cat ear prison, I don't like that. I just stayed in the bee cats, me, you see, so I... Why, but, how was she worse? Because was it more squalid or more people to, in the areas or...? It was more squalid and it was, there was more violence, more drug use, you know, so I had to keep my boundaries in place all the time because, you know, people say, you know, when you say to people, I didn't take drugs, you know, and like, and they go, well, he's dodgy if he doesn't take drugs. I'll, you know, we'll watch him and that. And I'd have to say, no, I didn't take drugs because it makes us paranoid. It makes us feel violent. It makes us behave. I start selling all me, all me canteen. I start living like a, a bump, like a tramp. I kind of do that. That's why I don't take drugs. Not because of what you might think. So and that's how I 
reinforced my boundaries around drugs and prison, especially in, in CCAT. How did you overcome that suspicion on you then? Because you wouldn't do stuff with the fellas, take drugs with the fellas. Well, that went wrong. We run them, really. So they just trusted us. They trusted you? Uh, I was like, you know, now they, they just carried on doing that business and doing what they're doing, run this, and now it went wrong. Didn't come on top or nothing and was all right. So that's how... Because the longer I find, the longer you're on the landings with people and that, the more you find out. And it's normally around about the three-year mark on the landings where you start to really find out what people are about on the landings, you know? You can't hide so, anything, can you? They see no, you can't, no, no. Yeah. It comes out in the end. Yeah. It all comes out in the end, your behaviours do. So how far into your sentence were you at this point? I was over... In SECA, I was over tariff. So I'd done me 14 years. 14. I'd done me 14 and I was waiting on a parole hearing. Well, spending 12 months in SECA, which I ended up spending three, and then 12 in 12 months in DCAT, and I was released. So DCAT was the worst bit. So when you were 30s and you go to DCAT, why was it the worst bit? Because you had prison officers who were a pain in the arse, who were just on your case constantly terrorising you. They had you terrified to walk on the grass. So all the good work I'd done in Grendon, I had been in the sea cap for three years. But I'd managed to keep everything at bay, but it just started to make us more institutionalised, where we the screws were just totally micromanaging us and dominating us, walking on grass and... Stuff like that, you know? So I never got any real resettlement in my day cut. I just proved that I wouldn't run away and try and escape from prison and commit crime. And that's all I've done there. So you, your routine from the higher security levels then was disrupted when you went to DCAT, was it? Aye, yeah. It was. And that messed with your head? It didn't mess with my head, aye. One foot out the door, and that, it had my head, but I'd, I'd rather have stayed in close conditions. And I would, my head would have been better for getting out. I would have had more emotional strength. I would have had more emotional uh, strength to, to move forward in my life. But instead, I was drained. I was done in. It was that hard to get through that. I don't know if I would have survived three years in a day car. I was lucky to just, just to do 12 months. What was your job there? Uh, I, worked in, I worked in the polytunnels, gardening. Then I worked in uh, on the community bus. Then I started working in a charity shop outside. And I got sexually harassed. What? <laughs> and I was too scared to take hey, out the bullet. To take out the bullet. <laughs> in case I got in case I got uh, into trouble and sent back to close conditions. So I interviewed someone recently who got sexually harassed in a charity shop while in Cat D. Mm -hmm. Was it by an older woman who would, first of all, send you pictures? Can you it remember that story? Woman, <laughs> it was by an older woman, but she was a lovely woman, and uh, it was two women, actually, and uh, one of them, I can't, I can't. Uh, <laughs> let's put it this way, but I didn't want to... Chance, take any chances with this other woman because she come from a naughty London family, you know, and uh, she drove in a BMW M5, is it, a, is it an M5 on an M2? It was a soft top, it was lovely. She, really want, like your feet in the she wanted to take us out of the car and I was... I couldn't do it, I couldn't do it. Aye, oh, I felt... Because if I, you, you start inappropriate relationships, you, the, people, you know, I, I get sent straight back to close conditions for it, you know? Never ends well, never ends made. well, does it? Was she mm. doing it with other prisoners? No, I don't Not believe so. I, I don't know. I, I, she probably did when I was gone. Where did she go? Aye. But aye. So going back then to look at your character development like in the beginning you're like you're wild you want to escape you're fucking getting your throat slashed was there a point over the years where that person was crushed out of you and you were like that was that was the old me now i gotta change i gotta do good otherwise my life's gonna be fucked up forever 
I think when I when I realised I really it was two occasions when I really that had it an effect on us. One was when September 11th happened, and I was sat in Parkhurst in the association room watching the second plane going into the towers, right? And then I seen, and then like there was a few lads around us from a different country, and I, and I was charring and they were in for drugs and that, and they were charring, they loved Osama bin Laden and all that. And that was like, for me, that was like a point where, hang on a minute, I'm not against my government like that. You know, so that sort of like was a defining point for us. And then the second one was a couple of months later, because they were uh, doing a report on us every three years. And this lovely psychologist woman's in front of us, and she's asking us loads of questions, and I'm answering them great. And then she turned around and says to us, Stephen, what would you do if someone burgled your house and you knew who it was? And I just it stumped us and I sat there for about 10, 15 minutes thinking, what would I do, what would I do? I kind of turned around and see I'd gone around and I would do this to them, I'd do that to them and I'd burgle their house and that. And then after about 10, 15 minutes, the answer popped in my head. I phoned the police and that's what I said to her and she like knew that, but it took us that long to answer that question and that's when I knew there was something seriously wrong with us, that I had to get these criminal out of us and start sorting it out so I could be safe to get back into the community. But how hard was that? It was really hard. Now them groups, really, really, really hard and very, very challenging. You know, and I mean, you're owning stuff about yourself that you find totally embarrassing. The stuff that you don't even see about yourself and people's pointing it out to you and trying to own it and understand it is is difficult and used to say it to me it's cookie it's like pulling teeth we trying to get you to own anything you know and that's what it was like for a while for us but i had good insight you know and i did have some emotional intel intelligence even though i was like a teenage mentality all the time but i managed to achieve real emotional growth and change emotionally and that's why i love the place so much as hard as it was i love grinding a bit because of what i don't want us afraid me mind so what was your most challenging moment we're in grinding or the whole, or the whole like, lot your whole whole sentence I think it was standing trial for me and Dex offence. That was the most horrifying experience and facing my victim's family, it was just that's all that dominated in my mind was facing them and Would you say that that remorse propelled you to get on the right path? Almost oh, definitely. But I was still fantasising. I mean, when I was on the mound and, and, and right leading up to Grendon, I was still fantasising and rationalising things in a violent way, my heed, you know. And I would deny it and deny it and deny it. But once I start learning about my behaviours, when I'm angry and I'm shouting and I'm having a go at the screws or whatever and all that, and just having that emotional awareness of when I'm vulnerable to, to committing violence or to committing crimes and stuff and behaving in such a way, what, you know, and I just, I got, over time, I got that emotional awareness to grow to it's really strong and I didn't let it, I still get, I've still got the same issues Today is what I had back then. I just manage them in a with a positive outcome these days. No matter what's going on for us. What about you, Davy? What the worst? Your most mentally challenging moment in prison. Birmingham prison. How so? I had the screws on me back. The prisoners. I was putting myself on the block. I didn't know how to trust. I was mentally ill. I was stopped eating and drinking. 
I was hallucinating. I was lying on a concrete floor with a body belt on because they couldn't let us do because I was attacking them or threatening to attack them all the time. I didn't know where I was. That was my worst challenging experience in my life. Okay. Even my wife at the time went to the papers to get us moved. I mean, how did you get through that? I don't know how I got through it. I should have been dead. That's what the outcome they wanted, I think. But I got through it. And then when I got the sentence, I was laughing because I was expecting 20 years. When they said 10 and a half years, I said, oh, piss off. To the biggies. I just went and done it. I got all the time back apart from the assaults on prison officers. Uh, my last six months of my sentence. So I went from having 80 months to do to having three months to do. I was out in three months. Mm. The Catarized as a sea cat, but never sentenced to the sea cat prison. And then let us go. I think the most damning thing about Davy's trial was that when he was in the dock, and he'll explain himself, when he was in the dock with Paddy Conroy, what actually happened there, Davy? Paddy gave evidence first. And he blamed me for the shootings. And all he's got to do is convince the public that he never has put his, his evidence on podcasts. If I'm wrong, I'll, I'll kill myself. Oh. But the court the, 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 the court well, I know I'm 100% right. He blamed me for shootings. Shootings that were done on his orders. The violence to people that were done on his orders. He mentioned everything. It was young Grover this, young Grover that. Trying to distance himself from us. So he stood on the sand and blamed it purely on yourself? He gave, right. ev he gave evidence against Davy Glover, which is there in the depositions, which I've seen. First. First. The one that they had Paddy there, me second in command, Scott, and Paul, and that's the order when the witness box. Paddy went first. And because my QC wouldn't show my alibi, he swore me life away. What was your alibi, Davy? That I was at Durham Prison between half past one and half past three, visiting me father. When Collier was... Tortured? Why have they not reopened that case? Because I'm admitting it now. I admit I was there when he was tortured. But not when he was kidnapped? No, I was there when he got kidnapped. But I had an alibi. <laughs> I couldn't have tortured him all afternoon like Paddy says. Because mm, you weren't? Because I was 20 miles away in Durham visiting me dad. Till half past three. I've got to see a party did brag about doing that. I mean, like... He did? He bragged about... He, when it suits him, he puts the blame on to me. But when, it's, when he wants to highlight his tough man image, well, he's chief of Arnold anyway. Mm. Or when he bullet mentions the shot me father and don't blow his legs off. Oh, they just fell off. Shot him and his legs just fell off. Disgusting. What the hell? The same bloke would have tore the head off the two of them. Mm -hmm. It's true. <sighs> so you were his fall guy. And I wouldn't help him one iota when I'm shooting my father-in-law. Because all I said tell is, if you plead guilty and help Paddy, I'm walking away from you. 
And I didn't want that to happen, so I pleaded not guilty. Let them bring out what they want. Mm-hmm. But Paddy got in that box and swore my life away. He blamed the stairs and the Tamdies for making Collier make a statement against me. And other things that had, as he mentioned, just let him put it on. He's got it. He's the only one with it. And when I heard him on podcast, he says, oh, why should I have to put it on? If then we've got something on me, why don't they put it on? That's what he said on the podcast. So if he's gotten out of the head, put it on. See who was telling the truth. How does it make you feel when you hear him saying these things on podcasts? He's never bothered his paddy. It's not something I would really bother about. But he's just pushing away this, pushing away this. He forgets I've got new kids are all grown up. I've got new birds now. I've got now to lose. He's got a lot more to lose than me. He's just a coward. Bullying everyone with sexual comments in there. He's most You're definitely non-sis. a coward. I've got to if, see that. If you don't do what he says, then a nonce, or they've been done sexual activities with kids or women or dogs or whatever. And then it's a grass. Super grass, because the grass on paddy can Yet nobody ever did grass on them, this is the thing. Nah. It's why I wear this t-shirt, I wear it with pride. So I went to him, get the evidence and put it on, on, on podcast. I tried to help him with the thing. I admit the escape was my doing. And then I was setting Paddy up. I tried to help him. But he won't put it all down. He's just picking highlighting bits that could mean anything and putting them on. You became a registered police informer, Davey, didn't you? Aye. Do you, now that you look at everything that's happened over the last few years and the way that he goes on on YouTube in particular with his podcast, do you think there's potential there for Paddy to be a police informer? Yes. Do you believe he is? Yes. A man that's been nicked nine times wrong for the rest and he gets off nine times. How well? Mm. And I know when I was growing up the farm, right? He would do anything to get back in anyone, mm. him, but he mm. would. Sally said, Nan. Nan? Mm-hmm. He would. Well, he did. All the family have fell out with him over the man's house. The money from the man's house. They've all fell out with him over it. Mm-hmm. Well, Cookie, you were going up to the farm, weren't you, to, to, to see him originally. That's how we inadvertently met through you appearing as admin. And of course, you're now ex-admin. ex-admin. Yes. So you were his proud, admin? Proud ex-admin. <laughs> <laughs> I went up there foolishly thinking that I could help him rationalise things in his head in a positive way and start getting some positive emotional resolve. But I didn't. I only knew Paddy as a child. I didn't know him as an adult, you know, and that just wasn't going to happen, you know. He thought I was coming up there to negotiate with him on the police's behalf. Yes. <laughs> and he's turning around and saying to me because I've not asked I've just went up and tried to calm things down and he's saying to me stuff like tell him that they're not getting nothing unless I get me deal unless I get me money back and I get everything that I've asked for <laughs> he says otherwise I'm sticking to I give Glover their murder details on 
that statement, Davy, uh, that he give you the details to make that statement, and he's going to stick with that until he gets his deal. And the statement that he's talking about is something which Davy can't remember doing, and this was for the infamous Viv Graham murder. And it's the one thing I'd like to clear up because I've done two podcasts with you, Sean. And in the second podcast, there was a clip edited by many people on social media to say that I was laughing about the death of Viv Graham. Now, that's not something I would ever do. That's ridiculous, I, isn't it? I genuinely right, feel for the family. I've spoken to Anna Connolly, Viv's girlfriend um, and partner at the time that he was killed. And I do not know who killed Viv Graham. Mm -hmm. I've written, I have written Neither about it. I've written about it. But this statement that Cookie was talking about there was a statement which Paddy Conroy did send me back in the very early noughties. And it was basically a, a six-page document written in Birmingham prison. It was a statement that Davy gave. Now, Davy, it, and it actually stipulates in this, in this statement, Davy was naked and in a body belt when he gave this statement. That tells you what kind of mindset that Davy was in. It wouldn't be allowed now. But in that statement, and the Davy will tell you in his own words now, who told you to make that statement? Paddy tried to get Mike a chance. Nick will be the game's murder. He never attempted the details of the crime to tell the police. But he told us to get Mike a chance. Nick will be the game's murder. Framing the sayers? Yes. Sayers, sayers. Mm-hmm. And tend to take a lie detector on that because there was two witnesses and one of them still alive, me ma's brother. So why did Paddy tell you to make that statement? Because he hated him, he thought it was a way of him getting off. He was in a desperate situation. I mean, he got a looker, he, he believed, uh, was it was a collie on the, uh, stoke on the, ball, on the no, block. Nice, stoke. He gave him a bit of looking for a thin ally, looking for a strong, powerful ally, because you just shot someone in the face on the quayside, and you know, as you, there were going to be repercussions for that. And there's Paddy, so he feeds Paddy. And Paddy said he had information about this. He, has. Uh -huh. he tried to do a deal with the judge at the trial. We had a closed court, and he, he tried to do a deal with his discs that he had, but he never had them. Never had a disc, never had an out from the start, man. And he tried to maintain that what was on these discs was that the Sears were police informers. Uh, and that's where the whole lie started. This uh -huh. is where he, the whole mm. trying to, to, to make the Sears out to be police informers and belittle them and, and you know, get them into trouble, I guess, within the criminal fraternity. Uh, but they've never been informers. And this is where the whole problem started. Uh -huh. That's right. But I guess from my perspective, having written Stephen Sears' book and only having that one side of the story, the, the benefit for me meeting Cookie and then getting a chance to meet Davey again properly has been that the true story now, because all the pieces of the jigsaw there, all starts to knit together. Mm -hmm. And it, it shows, you know, who really is to blame, not for the murder of Viv Graham, but who's to, who's to, to blame for this murder probably never, ever being solved. Mm -hmm. And because he, because he got... Davy to make a false statement and accuse the Sayers to try and get them into trouble, he's probably, it probably means that murder will remain unsolved for, for years to come. Mm -hmm. None of us know who did it. No, I don't know who. I don't know why I said it, Sean. I was off my head in fancy land. I didn't even know I said it till they produced it, of course. In a body belt, naked, being given a statement. And I was Five on. prison officers around us and three crime squad in a little room. Mm. And I was on remand in Law Newton Prison. Mm. So you guys are all tuned into this then, but for the public then, why did uh, Paddy end up in a dispute with the Sayers in the first place? Because he was in a desperate situation. He was looking He was looking at a kidnap. He was charged with kidnapping and torture. He's on double cat here doing a block in Durham. He comes across this bloke who shot one of the... shot. Plus, the Sears uh, got blamed for John Ryan Sears, and he's fed Paddy information saying, oh, I know the Sears, he's all this and that, will you protect me and help me? So Robert Stoko, um, the guy who, who Cookie's mentioning, uh, shot the Sears' dad at point-blank range through a car window. I remember Stephen telling us that. John Bryan Sears survived that, drove to hospital, um, and it was Robert Stoko who shot him. 
So what Robert Stoko did was, he then, realising that he was in serious trouble for attempted murder, an attempted murder of John Bryant's here, who so was a career criminal, mm -hmm. he then goes to see Paddy Conroy and basically feeds him the line that the Sears are police informers mm -hmm. and that he has some discs to give Paddy Conroy to prove this. Mm -hmm. And that's why Paddy then went on this ridiculous mission about these discs. The mm -hmm. discs never existed because never. They're, they're not police informers. But did Paddy have an incentive to do that? I mean, Jealousy. Jealousy? Jealousy. He wanted to be the main man in Newcastle. No, he did, yeah. The main. And when John Sears went to prison for the armed robbery and Stephen Sears was then locked up for extortion and blackmail of a local businessman, that left free reign for Paddy. And that was when he was approached by McIntyre, who was making a, a television programme to go on that show and, and basically promote his life of crime. Um, the Sears were released just before the programme was made. Approach was made via me to the Sears family um, about them appearing on the programme and they refused. Paddy went on to the programme and as we've all seen, it's now widely available on YouTube. Um, he went on and basically accused the Sears family of being police informants to, to a national audience. At that time, I'd asked the Sears if they would do their life story. They said they didn't want any publicity. They didn't want to do a book. But as soon as Paddy went on to a national TV programme, that was it. An unanswered lie becomes a truth. So Stephen Sears stepped forward and wrote his own memoirs. And that's why this continues to go on. And, and over lockdown, Paddy feels aggrieved that I have written the book. He feels aggrieved that I have aligned myself with a Sears family. And ultimately, he set up a YouTube channel to bully me. But unfortunately for him, he's come across somebody who doesn't take bullying. I don't... It doesn't worry me. He's doxed my address recently via one of his associates on YouTube. He, he continues to, to try and harass and bully. He tries to accuse me of sexual offences, which seems to be a common practice because he's done that with Cookie. Now he's done it with Davey. And ultimately, he seems to have not only a, a bizarre sexual obsession with the Sears, but now he seems to have one with me. And this is, it's quite worrying because this guy is clearly dangerous, he is clearly unhinged, but he is, is a pathological liar. Right. And from our perspective, we've come on today, really, to, for you to meet Davey for the first time. It's an exclusive. Davey, Davey's not really spoken at all before, except with me. Cookie has, has built up his own YouTube channel, and as, and as you can see today, is somebody who has reformed. He's, he's a positive story from the prison system. Mm -hmm. And... He now knows, having spent three months at that farm with Paddy, exactly what's going on there. And then you've got me, who is, is a, you know, a law-abiding citizen, somebody who, like you, podcasts, but also writes about true crime, but who tries to get the truth and the, the real message out there. And I won't be bullied. And if he or one of his cronies wants to come to my house, they're more than welcome to come in for a cup of tea, but please come when the family are out. <laughs> Just a, f a few further questions then. So when there was the attempted murder of the senior Sayers, was the friction between Paddy and the Sayers before no. that? In, yes. Before that? Was it? There was. It was alleged the Sayers went to a nightclub with a tax man. Brian Cox. Stuck a machine gun to Garside's head and beat him. And that Paddy stood up for Garside. Was that was he part of Paddy's crew? Aye. Gotcha. And what year was that? Ninety two three. So that was ninety two, ninety three. What year was the attempt on the senior? Ninety five. Ninety five. So there was stuff leading up to that then Aye. between the two families? It's but never Paddy the families, was, was it? It was never no, the families. No, 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 it was just Paddy. Paddy, 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 Paddy taking it too far. Think he's big and clever. Mm -hmm. Michael Conroy got on very well with the Sears. Aye. Most of them do. Mm -hmm. So it's a one man band? Yeah. Because yeah. the family don't want to get he's involved. He's got Bullock. Mm. And why has he got Bullock, Davy? Because Bullock's a wandering soul and he's got anywhere else to go. But there was, a <laughs> there was a situation with Paddy's brother, wasn't there? Aye. And what happened there? Paddy tampered with the gun, hand the gun, and he get the charges dropped for killing Paddy's brother. Because Bullock shot Paddy's brother by accident. Whose? Paddy Conroy's brother was shot dead by Bullock. By accident. 
Who is Paddy's like right hand man? Right hand man. By accident, he shot his brother dead by accident. Playing us in real life. That's bloody tragic, isn't it? It is, yeah. And I, and I always feel that terrible. I, I I feel for the family because of that. But also, I feel the fact that I always wonder why Paddy never makes reference to his brother. Mm-hmm. I've seen I've seen many families who've lost people every year pay at least a tribute on social media to somebody who they've lost. Yet he never seems to he never seems to do that. I always find that a bit bizarre. That's right. Because all family blame him. How was it found to be an accident? The witnesses in the pub. So Russian roulette, he got remanded for it at first, but he was only on remand a few weeks and then he got out because they got the gun back and had a head like trigger or something. Ah, so full So team. could you describe what actually happened then? Did someone gave him a loaded gun? The person put in Russian roulette, I believe. And he shot himself? I, I shot himself, a bullet shot him. Yeah. So he was found at fault for giving him the gun, is that...? He was Nick for murder. For murder? But someone took the gun away. Mm-hmm. And Paddy handed the gun in. Went and got it and handed it in. Right. So there could have been foul play? There was no charges or nothing afterwards, was there? No. When Bullock was released? No charges. Was there any, ever any attempts on Paddy's life? I wouldn't say so, unless he wouldn't be, I knew Sean. All this, what Paddy says, I ran at people putting signs. Why put signs on the gun? You can't the bucket. <laughs> no, well, it's, you know, I talked to one of my friends who, who Paddy's absolutely convinced has tried to kill him three times. And, the pan and I went and told him, and he, he's absolutely shocked and kind of believe that Paddy thinks he's been... Now he understands why Paddy's kept him at arm le- arm's length all this time and didn't want, want him to him and that. You know, because every time somebody like approached him out like that, he would, he would help Paddy. You know, not try and kill him, but that's just the way Paddy is, isn't it? He's been able to get away with telling a lot of lies because Davy hasn't been well. Mm-hmm. And Davy's never been well enough to come out and tell his story. That's right. And like even the day that I went to interview Davy with, with Neil Jackson a few years back, when Davy arrived, he was shaking, he was very incoherent. It's why we only got six or seven minutes of an interview. We were hoping to get a good podcast with him. And it was before I even started the channel. We just wanted to do it. It was going to be part of a documentary. I actually felt really sorry for Davey being put in that position. We got him there, and I wish I hadn't got him there. And I, and I just thought we would never get to the day where Davey could actually come and speak for himself. Mm-hmm. And unwittingly, Paddy's relationship with Cookie and bringing Cookie to the farm has actually led to the, you know, led to the, you know, the interview we've been able to do today because Davey is of sound mind now. Mm-hmm. He's on his medication, he takes his medication, and he's, as you can see, I mean, he's, he's very coherent with regards to the, the facts now, and I think that's great. And I was criticised because the six or seven minute video that we put out, which is, you know, a lot of people have watched it, they said, well, you've led him with the questions, you've done this, you've done that. So I, I rectified that by doing an interview with him, and it, we did an unedited video with him, and it was, it was spot on, and it's, it's been met with, with great approval. But today has been the same. You know, it's been good to get him in front of somebody who is impartial. Like you, the pair of you are impartial, you're yeah, unbiased. You don't have a, a side to take. I know you've been accused of being biased by, by Paddy as well. But ultimately, you know, you, you can see, you know, and, and you're hearing it for yourself. And I, I just hope that this message on your platform, because you've got a big platform and well-respected in what you do, that this message gets out to the general public more, that, you know, this has never been about setting Paddy up. This is not me trying to, you know, to, 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 to coach people or coax people into believing one side of the story. It's there for everybody to see. It's, it's, just, it's black and white. And like Davey says... If he gets the paperwork out that Paddy's sitting on, you know, it would prove what Davey's saying is true, you know. Mm-hmm. How does it feel to come here today, Davey, and get this off your chest? Well, I feel okay with Stephen and that and Steve. 
Are you two still as tight as ever, yeah? Oh, yeah. Not as yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> tight as him and Dad. Went through a lot. We spend 24 hours a year with each other. You do? Mm -hmm. Don't have anything to hear about. We did, didn't we, Davey? Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, it was wish my well. big brother who looked after <laughs> us. I'm oh, sorry, it was my big brother who looked after us. To another mother. <laughs> So what he's going to do his book now, which is which yeah. I think is great, and I'm I'm going to publish it. But but Cookie's Cookie sent me a couple of sample chapters of a book that he was writing. Um, but then when we got to, we got to know each other a bit better, we've done a few podcasts together, and and then he, he mentioned about Davy, and Davy was really well. I said, you know, maybe he's do that, and Cookie Cookie and Davy are going to work on a book together. So yes. collab, yeah, yeah. cool. Gonna, uh, Can't wait. Going to be good. I'm going to write it. I'm going to try and write it. So that will be good. Yeah, I wish Wildman was here. Would have loved to have met you guys. Definitely. Uh, yeah. I see the similarities. Definitely. See similarities. <laughs> like your relationship is like mine and Wildman's relationship. <laughs> Wildman was a legend, like mm -hmm. absolute yes. legend. I'm glad uh, I got a chance to meet him. Right. Well, I, I've, you know, I tried to stay out of the Paddy thing, but he put a video out there. And he, he was screaming at me and, and saying, you fat bastard sidekick, wild man. And this was after wild man was dead, totally disrespecting him. I think the problem was, ultimately, we did a, we did a trailer, which was for Operation Sears, the book that I wrote. And I asked you, as a favour, if you would put that trailer on, um, uh, on your videos. And, you know, I can categorically state, you've never been, you've never taken any sides. You don't take any sides full stop, Sean. You, you know, you're very professional like that. But I asked you to put a, a, a trailer on for Operation Sears, and that's what he didn't like. And that, that, sadly, that's what he didn't like. And he, was, he, was, he thought that meant that you were on our side. There's no sides, you know. I'm in, really, I'm impartial. I, you know, I can go and speak to anybody. Um, I know people who don't get on with certain villains, and you know, I can speak to both parties. That's that's the whole point of being, you know, a, either an author or, or somebody who you know does documentaries or podcasts or whatever. You you have to be impartial. But unfortunately, when you put your name to a book and there's something in there which criticizes a party, they're not going to like it, and, and that's it. It's as simple as that. So where's it all going then with Paddy? How is it going to conclude? I, 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 I hate to say I hate to say that, you know, this has got to come to an end at some point. I personally feel Paddy Conroy will go too far with somebody and he will probably end up being arrested. Um, I, I, th heard. I think what he wants is he wants with regards to me, and I can only speak about my circumstances, I think he wants me to pick up the phone and ring the police. So then he can go onto a podcast and say, See, I told you He's a grass. He's a grass, yeah. blah 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 blah. Now I could do that. I'm, I'm not a criminal. Mm. I won't be judged by my friends or family if I pick the phone up and ring and make a report about Paddy Conroy or his friends who sit in that shed talking lies. I wouldn't be judged. Would it, would it, would it affect me as far as being a, a true crime writer's concerned? I doubt it as well. No. Um, be, you know, maybe one or two villains who I know would say, well, actually, Steve, you made a statement now. I can't be involved in you. And that's fair enough. But I've written every book that I wanted to write. I've met all the people I wanted to meet. Do I see myself being a true crime writer for the next 10, 15 years? No, I want to focus on being an actor. So really, if this is the last book I do with Davy and, and uh, Cookie, then happy days, I can move on. But am I going to ring the police? No, I'm not. I'm going to let my fear take its course. My life's mapped out. If someone's going to come to my house and shoot me on my doorstep at the beck and call of Paddy Conroy, then that was the way my life was supposed to go. And that's the way I live my life. Mm. I've always lived it. I did the doors for 18 years. I never made a statement about anybody on the doors. Sean, that's the way it is, mate. And, um, you know, from my perspective with Paddy, I think that he will make the wrong move with the wrong person. Davey says he might get hurt. He might do. Who knows? He may get, he may get arrested and have uh, to go to yeah. prison. The fact, that, the fact that his YouTube channel hasn't been shut down with some of the things that he's saying and the complaints that have been made... I would say maybe there are other powers allowing this to go on. Ah, yeah, there was well, see. So one last question about Paddy. Does his shed really stink a cat piss? Aye. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's the only pussy he gets. <laughs> <laughs> and he doesn't purr. <laughs> <laughs> His next video will be about Cookie and Des, I guarantee it. Oh, well, that's all it. I don't mind. So when's your guys' book coming out then?
Eh, hey, I'm not sure. It'll be, it'll be early next year, I imagine so. Mm-hmm. I mean, the amount of time, you know, you guys have served and everything else you've done, it's, it's like, how are you going to fit it in a book? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's a couple of books in it, really, you know. Will Just it be a on special the time chapter? With, the time <laughs> of, <laughs> Sorry, I'll There's a definitely a book, there's definitely a good book, just on right. me and Davey together on the streets in the West End and that. It's definitely a good book there. And then there's, there's, there's another book for you there and for me, one my prison book. That's all right, I did it prison. party time. It was all me and Wild Man, what we got up to. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, the next one's the jail, next one's the prison. <laughs> uh, right, so you could do a series. Yeah. See, how, see if I can get this knocked up really good for me. See what we can do. <laughs> and see so you're focusing on acting? Yeah, I mean, I've just done Requiem with uh, Richard John Taylor, which comes out on Boxing Day. That's my first lead role. Um, I play a gangster called Aaron, and it's about um, kids across Europe. Um, and I'm basically going into uh, uh, to, to get this little girl because this bloke's, you know, basically taking a lot of money off my boss. Uh, Michael McKell, uh, the actor, is my boss in it. And um, yeah, I, I work with the talented Nina Cranstoon, who um, I've known Nina for a lot of years. She's the only female professional boxing promoter in the in, in the UK. And me and her play alongside each other, and it was it was a great great to do. So doing that, and of course the Sears film, we start we start filming that uh, all all going well in October this year in Newcastle. So I play Stephen Sears in it. Um, I need to bulk up a little bit, I think, but between now and then. Um, that's, he, he told me that. Uh, <laughs> but I'm looking forward to it. That's, that in itself is going to be great. And um, we also did, I did a film called The Huntress of Auschwitz, where I played a police officer, which, um, which has just come out today. Oh, congrats. When I had the virus, and I was down for 14 days watching Netflix here and there, and it was like, every other crime film I was watching, he had you in it, or Joe Egan. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I think some of my favourite one is still Rise of the Foot Soldier, purely because oh. it's a great franchise. And yeah, I did, I did, I did, you know, I did the third film. What was that dodgy film you were in? You know the one, James? That we... Killer Bitch? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Paddy, Paddy does like that one. Um, he thinks it's great. He says it's terrible acting and he's going to play Stephen Sears. <laughs> I've moved on a lot since then. Um, but you know what? I enjoy it, and yeah, that, I mean that's what I want to do full time. It looks terrible, but great fun. It was, it was good. Yeah, it was good. The only downside was that Jason Mariner, the Chelsea headhunter, shoots me in the back of the head Ooh. in that film, and he goes one nil to the Cockney boys. <laughs> <laughs> I've never lived that down. But yeah, it, it, look, it's it's fun. It's nice to get away, and a bit, it's a bit of escapism, pretending to be something you're not. The ambition is to be the villain in Coronation Street still. Um, <laughs> and I've said that to you before. <laughs> I'll get there eventually. I'm getting. I'm now starting to get a couple of castings for these soaps so yeah, I'm yeah. yeah. <laughs> I might play a cookie um, in, 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 in prison stories with Del, uh, Dennis Nielsen <laughs> so every time we're up here or Middlesbrough we hear a lot of stories about Lee Duffy did you guys have any I do- knew Lee you knew Lee aye bloody hell what was that like then he was a good lad a bit of a hothead but he was a good lad how did you get to know him? Prison. Prison? Which one? Uh, Durham. Durham. I was 15, he was on the cons. We were both in the seg, and they put one exercise together in the cage. And then after that, I seen him a few times. Liverpool. He was in Liverpool with John. I was on the YPs then on the cons. I remember a few times. He was a hothead, mate. You could fight. Did you see him in action? I heard the, the aftermath of a few fights. Which ones were they? In Liverpool prison. We've not heard what happened in Liverpool prison. He knocked a few of them out in the gym. He was Jim Audley. Was that a regional thing against the Scousers or...? I think they just done something league and league. <laughs> <laughs> That's tend to be the case. Mm. And he would just blow his head. And what did he look like? Big, tall, blonde hair, good looking kid. He was well respected then everywhere. You had respect as a fighter. Or intimidated? 
Og så må vi være på i dag. Vi har vi har jo spæk. What? what? Yeah, mostly. And what was the problem with him and Viv Graham? I think it was a problem until Duffy came up here yeah, to try and fight it. Because he wanted to be the hardest man, was it? Uh, and what about Sykes then? Was that before your generation, Paul Sykes? No, I met Sykes and <laughs> Oh my God. Is there anyone you haven't met? <laughs> I met Sykes before he went to the whole unit when he kept the screws eating with a dumbbell. What? What was that over? Taking the weight off Sykes. Okay. Or something. It gave his something head to do with the gym. <coughs> and the screw said something and Sykes caved his head in with a dumbbell. Got five, six years for the seven years. Something like that. Mm. He liked the YPs, didn't he? Oh, he liked the YPs. <laughs> was that a true thing or was that just a scur story? Well, he used to act on it. He used to run out the door and the YPs used to scatter all over it. <laughs> <laughs> so it was an act, it was an act, but I don't know. I've never actually seen him day anyone. And what was he like when you talked to him? He, we were pouring water out the window on him, down below, and he was threatening me, because we were IP. <laughs> 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 He had, a, he had a run in with a cat, didn't he, Davy? Aye, uh, so I got to tell the story that the life has cat, that the life I had tamed, was shitting on Sykes' bed or something, or in his cell, and Sykes got the cat and cut a, a hat with the cat and put it on and walked out the land As on the land with. So he wore a cat as a fucking uh, hat? Uh, like, like a raccoon cat? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Oof. Who who would you say was more physically, or just the presence was more intimidating, uh, Lee Duffy or Sykesy? Sykesy. Sykesy? Aye. Really? In what way? A bit bigger than Lee. A bit bigger. But was he more menacing? Aye. Wow. He wore a cat as a hat. No, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard some stories about him, like. Which ones? About the YPs and Leeds. What happened there? He's just knocked the moon and take them. What, take the booty? <laughs> Holy shit. Can't wait to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well. So is there anything you feel that we've missed out, Steve? I think you've covered it all. I just think, you know, it, it's been great for you to meet Davey because I think, you know, it gives you that other... The missing piece of the jigsaw on Tyneside. You've met everybody, really, I think, that you could meet now. Um, you know, you couldn't meet Viv or Lee because they're no, they're no longer here. You've met Stephen. You've heard Stephen's side of the story. Yeah. You know, you've, you've now seen Davey. You've, you know, you've met Brian. You know, you've, you've, had, you've had the different corners. You've seen Cookie as well from, you know, from, from a, another perspective, you know. And, and obviously me as an impartial observer... You know, yeah, I think you have, you have you have had it all now, you know, and you know you've obviously interviewed Jamie many times about Lee. So, from 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 the northeast perspective, I think this is like job done, you know. Um, the only person you could interview is is Paddy, and I know you've tried to do that. Um, I think <laughs> I think you should try. I think you've got enough ammunition now to go and and, and at least put a request in. I don't think he'll do it because he's a coward, but I think it would be good for you to at least try one more time to get him on mm. get him on your podcast because there's a lot of questions which which you should answer, you know. When you said that we tried, did we offer to get him on with you or something like that? Was that it? Yeah, I would come on and do it. I've, I've said mo on more than one occasion, I would happily sit in the same room as Paddy Conroy and do a podcast with him. I've got nothing to hide, nothing to be afraid of, nothing to be, nothing, nothing, nothing that I've told a lie about. I can produce whatever, whatever he wants us to produce. The paperwork, paperwork is is exactly as I've said it is. It's there. It's in order. Um, you can pick holes in it if he wants to. But I'd happily go on a, on a live with him. I tried, as you did, to go on his own live. Um, <laughs> I heard about that. We might have been, we might have been a little bit naughty. We might have been a little bit naughty. We might have been a little bit naughty. That was me allegedly. <laughs> I, d I mean, I didn't even recognise you with those big glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> I just, it was the 
idea allegedly came from. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what, joke, joke aside, it was an opportunity to see how he would react with me in his face. Yeah. And I think that, to the general public, spoke volumes. He had his perfect opportunity did. on his own live to ask me and grill me. He could have humiliated me. He could have tried to do whatever he wanted. What did he do? He couldn't get us off the screen quick enough. Well, that was his whole thing, wasn't it? His whole beef was we needed to go on and explain or be questioned by him. And as soon as we did it, we were gone within seconds. Yeah. Unbelievable. I, I mean, he panicked, you know, and... and what can you, you know? What can you say? I think it sums him up. He doesn't want it. He, he wants us to continue to go backwards and forwards. And the reason I haven't done that is because it simply builds his channel up. We've, we've seen it with other situations on YouTube. The con constant backwards and forwards builds people's channels up because people like the drama. So from my perspective in December, I decided that I was going to stop. And that's what I did. That's what I did. I stopped. So, you know, from my perspective, it's over. Today... Through that door on the left, Davey. Through the door on the left. So from my, from my point of view, I just decided really to, to draw close to it in December. And I'm glad I did because I haven't watched these videos. I have somebody who watches the videos, who downloads the videos and keeps them on file. Um, you know, there's more than one copy of them and I'll keep them for a rainy day. If I need them, I need them. Um, if, if there needs to be some kind of production of evidence, if something happens at my house, I've got all of these videos which, you know, basically tell the story from start to finish of this insane, uh, you know, campaign of abuse against me for a period of 12 months, which totals 321 videos now and counting. And ultimately, you know, it, it, you know, if you want to hang yourself, keep on doing what you're doing, Paddy. You, that's what you're doing. And um, you may not care, but, you know, even if I'm not here to tell the tale and I get, I get murdered by somebody on my own doorstep because of this ridiculous farce, then there's evidence there and that evidence points at one man and that's Paddy Conroy and anyone associated with him in this campaign of hatred. I think he's just trying to get, like, views of people's coattails. I agree, but... When you start putting people's addresses online, which is illegal in this country, um, then that is taking it to a whole new level, Jen. And, you know, it takes a certain person not to react to that. And I'm that certain person. And I will fight fire with fire, but I'll also fight fire with logic. And that's what I'm doing in this particular situation. And my silence has really hurt him, I can tell. Um, and I'll only ever come back when I've got something to say or when I've got somebody else who would like to say something. And that's why we've got these two gentlemen here today. Oh, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, Paddy, if you're watching on. this, then you've got an opportunity to come on and sit down with Steve and get all this ironed out. You said that is what you wanted. You said you had a problem with Steve. It needed to be resolved face to face. Stop dragging it out. You've disrespected my best mate after he died, which I found very offensive. I am a neutral person. I will provide this platform for you to come on and sit down, mano a mano, and just fucking hash this out with Steve. Stop being a little punk and doing all these crazy videos that are just mindless and, and doxing and attracting all these little trolls to your channel. Because that's all it is. It's just toxic followers and toxic views. End the madness and come on and be a man and do the right thing. Step up, speak to Steve in the same room. Your security will be guaranteed. <laughs> Davey won't be there. <laughs> and sort this out. And as for you, Davey, I'm, honestly, I'm having flashbacks. So I've had flashbacks of Wildman all the way through this, this interview. <laughs> It's like the spirit of Wild Man is in the room. <laughs> Especially when you laugh, he laughed just like you laughed. <laughs> Same <laughs> eyes and everything. It's, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, been, it's been a real buzz. It's been a real honour to meet you finally after Steve has spoke so highly about both of, 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 both of you. And all, all the best after everything you've been through. All the best in your lives. All the best with your book. And, and Cocky, bloody hell, man. I, I didn't understand until today everything you've been through. And right. Good God. Yeah, so power to you for having the mental fortitude to turn your life around and, and be on the right path right now. So Cheers, for the people, man. For the people watching this, then 
All the links uh, for everybody will be in the description box below the, the video. So please go down and support what Steve is doing and his projects with, with Cookie and Davey. And um, let us know in the comments what you think. Do you want to see Paddy come on this platform and just sit opposite side of a table, man to man with Steve and get this resolved? Instead of just doing all these videos from, from a distance saying this and that and all this drama continuing and all this nonsense continuing from afar, you've got the opportunity now, Paddy, because you got our attention. You know, you, you brought this to me. You said something was on my channel that you had a problem with and you said you had a problem with me that I didn't even know about. You didn't ever, ever communicated this to me from the beginning. I'm a reasonable person. If you had come to me in the beginning, I would have looked at, at whatever it was you had a problem with and made a decision about it. But you left it so late and you escalated it without me even really knowing what the whole story was behind it. Steve's come here today and explained it to me probably for the first time. I've, I've, not, I've no idea what's been going on in Newcastle with you and the Sayers over the years. But yeah, like I, I, I do and I'm in on it. And I'm with the Sayers somehow because I've had Stephen Sayers on. I'm neutral. And I've only come to a full understanding today of really how this whole situation has developed because it's, it's been explained very clearly by these guys. So end the madness now. Come on. Stop doing these silly little videos from afar and speak to Steve. And that's, you know, that's, that's the only way this can end. What happens if he doesn't come on? Are you just going to leave it like that? I don't think he's, he's going to man up and do it. I don't know that. And I genuinely, I just genuinely wanted to make sure once again that the, that the message gets out on a big platform because it needs to be... It needs to be told, and people need to, to know the truth. And, and there will always be people who support Paddy. There will always be people who believe Paddy's side of the story. And there will always be people who don't like me or don't like Cookie or don't like Davey. We understand that. Life is like that. But when the facts are you know, sp spelled out like we've spelled them out today, there is, there is no getting away from it. And unless he brings that paperwork up, especially that Davey talks about. You know, it's it's a key that he keeps calling people grasses, he calls people nonces, he calls people this. It's deflectionary tactics, which he's used all of his life. And that's the sad oh, part yeah. about it. It's, you know, Davey, Davey will tell you he was there in the dock. You can ask anybody who was there with him in the dock. Conroy put it all onto Davey. And look at what it, look what happened to Davey. It caused a mental breakdown. It caused, it caused, it, it caused his life to be ruined, really, mm -hmm. you know. So we're offering him what he wants to sit down to sort it out. That's what you told me you wanted was the opportunity to speak to us and sort it out. That's what we're offering you. So you can say whatever you want. There's no way around that really. You either come on and do it or... You don't, you get forgotten about. <laughs> yeah, I, I've already moved on. I've, I've moved on. I've moved on. I don't sit, I don't sit at home. I don't sit at home worried about the guy. I don't because, you know, why, why waste my life? And, and, you know, I've had a lot more to deal with the, you know, in the last few months. Uh, real life, not, yeah. not, not fake life. And, you know, for me... I don't sit and worry about these idiots, and and that's what they are. Sadly, I just let them. I just let them do what they want to do. And as I say, my my man continues to download these videos and and put them away for a rainy day. If that rainy day ever comes, if it does, <laughs> we all know why it's come. And I just want to say, R.I.P. Your mum, Steve, and for fucking animals, any animals who have trolled you during that period of time. I'm so sorry, mate. Does not get fucking lower than that. No, thank a you absolute, for that. Absolute scum. And I want to thank everybody for the support. I mean, you know, whether it was Cookie or whether it was you or, or you know, whoever, people who reached out and, and offered the support. And the YouTube community, although they can be trolling, has been massively supportive. And as you know, my, my channel is predominantly football. You know, we do NUFC matters seven nights a week. And I continue to do that throughout the whole period of my mum's illness and then subsequent death and then funeral but that got me through because the support of the people in the chat the moderators um, especially who, who uh, were looking out for us you know I've just got to be thankful that you know I created that YouTube community because there's been a massive support and um, likewise a lot of the people who I met through you know being an admin on your page uh, you know on your channel as well and, and just the stuff that we've done briefly with me you and Jen over the over the months it's been great and you guys have been fantastic so thanks for your for support and um, I'm you know it's got me it, it helped me gain the strength and I've just I've just cracked on doing what I do you know and the other thing is Steve what do the paddies of the world matter when you've got as much going on in your life as you do. Yeah. You're a prolific author. You've got your channel. I've seen that just raise up in followers. You, you live streams of sports stuff have got massive views. You've got so much going on. Yeah. 
It's, it's irrelevant, really, isn't it? All the of course decades. it is. Of course it is. And that's why, because I said to Cookie before we started the interview, I, get, I, I was getting to the point last year where I was watching it and watching it and, and getting involved in it. Take I was, it in. Yeah, and, and, and suddenly, suddenly then you feel you've got to respond. And before you know it, you've wasted three hours of your day mm. when you could have been doing something with your kids, you could have been doing something writing a book, you could have been going out for a walk, doing whatever, you could have been doing something. And I just thought in December, I'm going to make one video, which I did with Video Craig. I did the, the full interview from start to finish and explained everything about this whole situation just with regards to me. And I said that would be the final word that I would give on it. And I've been as good as my word. I, even when people have come on podcasts and they've tried to get us to talk about it, I've just refused. But I did say that if Davey ever came... Uh, back out to do, came to do something that I would rectify that interview because I because I really didn't feel that interview did Dave, did Davy justice and we never got we never got the real Davy Glover, which is what I did thanks to Cookie and um, I, as I say my relationship with Cookie only comes through the fact that he was you know with Conroy for a few months was you know involved in the situation and and that's that's a massive positive that's come for it because. I, you know, for me, I, I can just move on and, and that's what I've done. And, you know, we've, we've come back this again. I don't have anything else to say. Unless Conroy comes on your channel, I've got nothing more to say on it and I won't be wasting any more time on it, ever. And that's the bottom line, isn't it? Because you do get sucked in. I got addicted a bit as well to these dramas. Yeah. and It's like, but I've realised it's the gutter. It's the absolute gutter. Because years from now, people are still going to be watching videos, for example, Davey telling his story or Cookie telling his story, that's, it's timeless, isn't it? That's right. There's, it's inspirational, there's lessons. A year from now, who's going to give a shit about what the people are saying about Decker Heggy today or what people are saying about Paddy Conrad today? No one's going to give a shit, are they? No. So it's just pulling yourself out the gutter, which I had to do myself, and it was my viewers who said, Sean, stop posting these podcast war videos, we're fucking <laughs> sick of it, it's childish. Yeah. It was my own viewers who had pulled me out the gutter. And I realised I got to go back to my roots and just you know putting this great you know content out there that people are going to watch forever. Yes, yeah, I mean sadly you're right, but certain names are getting clickbaited on a regular basis. I've done it myself, you know, but only whenever I clickbait someone's name on a YouTube channel, I'll do it for a specific reason or I'm asking a specific question. You you, you play the game sometimes, but you're right. You get dragged into that cesspit of um, of, of you know YouTube, and and, and it can be a it can be a massive positive and can help people. We've raised over thirty thousand pounds for the for the Newcastle Food Bank on, on our NUFC Matters channel Brilliant. by doing a T-shirt each week and raffling it off. And we get people bidding from anything from two fifty to a thousand pound each week on there, and it goes directly to Newcastle's food bank. We shouldn't have to have food banks, but it does. So that is my that is my positive out of the YouTube fraternity, yeah. Yeah. rather than you know getting involved in who's done this to what and who's done this to that, and it's just it's awful. I've and seen I, some channels go from producing great content now to being like the gossip newspapers, and, it, and the sad thing is they get rewarded by the views. Yeah, but these views are. The toxic followers and toxic subscribers. YouTubers, if you're in the gutter, if you've become the gossip columnist of YouTube, <laughs> it's, it's unsustainable. You get the views now, but these toxic followers and subscribers will stab you in the back at the first opportunity. Produce solid content, build a, a, a lovely community of people with, with solid followers, and you will sustain but, but get out of the gutter, for God's sake. And get some moderators. <laughs> <laughs> Who you can trust. Hey to the Atwood Arby. And a, good, <laughs> and a good cameraman like James. And a good co-host. <laughs> and, and a good co-host like Jen. And Neil Jackson for me. And with the power, the divine cosmic energy power of Shoe Watson, we've, both, we've treated us both today. Can you see the fire in our eyes? <laughs> we are ending. We are ending this podcast and we always end our podcast with a hug so thanks fellas oh, yeah, yeah cheers we end with hugs oh, oh. I can't hug someone what has the world come to exactly come here well, thank, thank you thank you yeah. thanks mate thank you mate thank you brother oh, thank you man oh, wow. brilliant fantastic Gadfly Press is proud to announce the publication of Big Joe Egan, the toughest white man on the planet. And that statement came from none other than Mike Tyson, who wrote the introduction to the book. If you want to check it out, the link is in the description box below the video. 
It's got almost five stars on Amazon. And it is mind-blowing stories of Joe's rise in boxing. You've got the crime story of what went down at the pub, the war at the pub, Joe's incarceration, and how the toughest white man on the planet could not be held down, how he rebuilt his life. He's gone from strength to strength, and what he's, you know, you can see right now what he's doing all over the world. So links will be in the description box below the video. Thanks for watching. And if you want to see the full podcast, it's on our channel now. In which he talks about Michael Francis, Tyson, and loads of big names that he's worked with. Fascinating stories. Check it out. So the book, Big Joe Egan, Toughest White Man on the Planet, is available in all three formats. Audio, ebook, and paperback worldwide on Amazon. Link in the description box. Here at Boomer and Jen, we offer a wide range of organic or recycled clothing. We all know our planet is important. We only have this one. So it's vital that we all work together to slow down and reverse the changes to the environment. Whilst we all know that big industry are having a significant effect on pollution, here at Boomer and Gen, we believe that if we all make small changes, we can do our part. Fast fashion causes detrimental effects to the planet. Not only is nearly 20% of global wastewater produced by the fast fashion industry, but there is a considerable amount of fast fashion ending up in landfill. So let's move away from fast fashion items that are only worn once or twice and start wearing extremely comfortable, durable and environmentally friendly clothing and ethical jewellery. Boomer and Jen was founded in a quiet town in Devon in 2018. It has now gone from strength to strength as the world is becoming more aware of the current climate situation, helping our customers to buy sustainable, quality clothing. All of our products are fair trade and registered with the Global Organic Textiles Standard Association. Check us out on organic cotton clothing dot co dot uk